Amen. I want you guys to know that when you have concerns, we take those things very seriously. And I know that there are some of you that think that a pastor should be more respectable up here. So I want you to know, we went out and found one of those. (laughs) And he's here with us today. He's already dressed down because of me too, so (laughs) sorry. (laughs) It's <laughs> my bad. But we, have, we, we are blessed to have Pastor Ed Lanning joining us this morning. Um, he has been a, a pastor for over 15 years. He's now been retired, you said, for about 10 years? Yeah. Sound about right? There we go. So he spent nine years in Calvary Bible Church. Uh, I guess some of you might know that from Mountain View Bible Camp in Dugspur. Uh, spent nine years there, spent another six years in Columbus, Ohio as a, as a preacher and pastor as well. And uh, like I said, he is doing me a huge favor by letting me get my, my feet under me and catch my breath and everything this week. Um, and I know that we're going to be blessed to receive a word from him this morning as well. So with that, uh, if you would, let's give him a warm First Baptist Church welcome, Pastor Ed Lanning. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad to help out. Um, I just met Ryan this morning, so obviously he doesn't know whether I'm respectable or not. <laughs> and um, but I have my wife with me, Jean, and some of you might know several years back when we were in Dugspur Mountain View Bible Camp, maybe some of your grandkids' kids came out there, and um, she was my um, right-hand person. Um, no one knew at the church. She was my associate pastor, too. And um, also uh, the uh, four kids that we have, four great kids, James, and he's married to Francis. They live in Dallas, Texas. And our youngest son, Evan, is here this morning, and he's going to Lynchburg next month to study, get his master's degree. And uh, also we have a son, Ryan, in um, Raleigh area, and um, a daughter, who lives in Duxbur, and she gave us our first grandchild, and he's two and a half years old. His name's Judah, and I wanted to joke also one more little aside here, uh, jokingly, that I told Ryan I could come this morning because Judah wasn't doing anything. This, he was busy this weekend. He went, away with, he went away with his parents to Lynchburg to visit some family, um, but if he, if he was at my house or if he was coming today, I wouldn't have been able to preach today. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm really privileged to share uh, the word. I don't often get to do this. Um, I understand Ryan's predicament because I had Lyme, actually chronic Lyme, maybe I still have Lyme, um, back in the 2006 or 7. That started my progression downward health-wise. So I was telling him, I'm glad he's got some antibiotics and they took care of that. Because back in 2006 or 7 when I got it, all the doctors were saying, there's no Lyme disease around here. You know, it's not this far south. There's no Lyme disease. So they didn't do anything about it. And um, anyways, that was kind of a progression. But in 2016, um, I did have a bounce back in the sense that I had an open heart uh, bypass surgery. And it gave me a little bit more air to breathe. And I'm really thankful for that. Spend some time with my family. Jesus describes himself in several different ways in Scripture. But I think that one of the ones that is most perhaps radical, maybe one that we can't capture as well as others, is that Jesus is our servant, Savior. And would you turn with me in John 13 in your Bibles, please? Or open up your Bible whatever form you have there in front of you, we'll look at John 13. And I'm going to start reading in verse 1. We'll read down through verse 17, friends. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world... He loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, 
to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except his feet for his feet, but is completely clean and you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Let's pray, please. Father, we love you. We're so thankful for this opportunity to have your word in front of us. And please, by your spirit, be our teacher and we want to praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus is our servant Savior. And I want you to, if you could please, visualize with me this scene. Um, I think some things that we have seen, maybe paintings, pictures, and so on, don't always help us in picturing the scene in the upper room. Because remember that in those days, even if you were to go to the um, ancient, not the ancient, but in the ancient Near East, they sat or reclined on the floor. And if you were to go um, to places in the Middle East, for instance, my, uh, one of our sons, Ryan, spent two years in the Middle East. And I remember seeing some pictures of his apartment there. Um, there weren't many chairs around. <laughs> they, they sat on the floor and, you know, they've got those beautiful oriental rugs and they sit on those. And when they were eating in the day, in Jesus' day, yes, they sat or reclined down at a table, but the table was only like this far off the, <laughs> off the floor. So um, picture with me that these disciples have uh, come into the upper room They've been walking on dirty, dusty streets. And as they're, as they're coming into the room, at some point, Luke tells us in Luke 22, 24, we see that they were arguing, remember, they were arguing about who was going to be the first or the greatest in the kingdom. This was the scene. This was, and so if you visualize with me for a moment, they come into this room, they go right to the supper table they recline at the table. They would be all around the table. And by the way, where do you put your feet when you're uh, lying around the table to eat? Just wherever you can put them, right? <laughs> and so maybe uh, their dirty feet um, were a constant reminder that somebody, I think that they had to be conscious of the fact that no one had offered to wash the feet. And that was a custom. You come into a place, and as soon as you come in, because of the dusty, dirty streets, 
You come in and there's usually a servant there to clean your feet so you're not bringing that all over the, the house. And especially not sitting and reclining at the table and eating with someone else's dirty feet in your face. You wouldn't like that. Well, this is going on here. And I don't know everything they were thinking, the disciples, but I know Jesus used it as an opportunity to teach them. And I think that what we see here in this passage is really a radical demonstration of humility. When you, when you see when Jesus told us in Matthew, as he told us to come to him, if you're weak, if you're burdened, come unto him. Why? Because he is meek and lowly in heart. Jesus is humility personified. The word humility, as you uh, trace its meaning, it means to stoop down. And so this is a beautiful picture as Jesus takes the towel. He assumes the towel. The disciples, his disciples, the ones that he chose, that he spent three years investing his life in, the disciples whom he loved. And by the way, the end of verse 1 says that he loved them to the end, which we can, could mean a couple different things, but part of the meaning is that he loved them to the very uttermost. He loved them in the greatest way. And now he demonstrates it for us in living color because the supper had started and he rose from supper. And I think that their eyes were immediately looking to Jesus because he was their rabbi. Now what's Jesus going to do? You know, he gets up in the middle of the supper. Um, the food's right there. Perhaps he wasn't even finished eating himself. And he gets up and he goes. And he takes the basin. And he pours the water. And the scripture says that he had laid aside his outer garments. So I think there's two things that we, are, that we learn together here. I think Jesus is teaching us what real service is to each other, what his love meant to the uttermost degree, and that he's showing us that we should do as he does, or have the same attitude as he does. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Remember in Philippians 2? Who being in the form of God, thought, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, which is the idea that Jesus, he didn't grasp that, uh, glory, that glory that always belonged to him, and that he deserved as the Lord. He didn't hold on to it, but he laid it aside in order to become a man. John said, remember in the beginning of the book, that the word became flesh. I always love that verse, John 1.14. The word, Jesus Christ, became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus is showing his disciples his greatest love for them and how they should love one another in service. And I think also, as we see that he laid aside his garments, and then right there when he um, uh, takes the basin and he serves, he stoops down and washes their feet. We see that he got up from the supper, laid aside his garments, and then he has this exchange, remember, with Peter that has to do with, you know, you're already clean, but not all of you. And I think there, we're going to get to it in just a minute, I think there he is speaking of a spiritual cleansing, that we need to experience a spiritual cleansing through the blood of Jesus. 
And I think he's saying there, we'll just get to it in just a minute. I'm going ahead of myself, as you probably can tell. So keep in mind that no one volunteered to wash the feet. No one volunteered. Jesus gave plenty of opportunity uh, for this, and they were very conscious of the fact that uh, their, their feet were dirty. But, you know, they had been so concerned about being the first to get first place, to um, have their ideas and their dreams and their whatever the, the motivations right then in the disciples' hearts seemed to be, they were looking to the coming kingdom of Christ and they wanted to be first. And again, Jesus expresses that in his kingdom, it is so different. <laughs> it is so different than what we think of in our world. In his kingdom, to stoop, to stoop down before him and before others is truly the most beautiful picture of what it means to be a, a child of God. And I'm not sure, I have a hard time even expressing this in words because if the 70s, if you think back, um, I guess you'd say I grew up in the late 60s, grew up in the 70s. The 70s and the 80s were the me generation, let's say 60s through 80s. Then the 90s or the 2000s up until this modern time, up till through today, up and through today are the me and me only generation. And so I think all of us, we can't help but be affected by our society, but so we have to try to get in the sandals of these people here and try to picture what Jesus is, is teaching them. It was, it was radical to them because their Lord, their master, their rabbi, their teacher, their, the guy they looked up to, the God-man, Jesus Christ, the one that they uh, worshipped. Even we worshipped him this morning through these beautiful songs. <clears throat> and by the way, my grandson would have really enjoyed your music today. He loves music. And I, I like that, to God be the glory, syn in the syncopation in that song. I really like that. Um, I enjoyed that. And so thank you for that music. But Jesus, excuse me. They were thinking about themselves. Jesus laid aside his outer garments and he began to wash their feet. <clears throat> I believe that Jesus was conscious completely of the fact that he was the creator. I mean, he indeed made the world. And now his hands, the one who made the world, Remember, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1. Now with those same hands that created the world, he stoops down and washes dirty feet. Isn't that a beautiful expression of, of humility? Of, I think that for my, in my mind, the stooping down is one of the main things I think about because it's such a beautiful picture of service. And um, often today when we think of people that are um, you know, great people or people that um, maybe we might look up to, um, people that have a lot of influence, they're the ones that oftentimes have other people uh, doing things for them all the time. They're the ones that might have others driving them around, right? Chauffeuring them around and protecting them. Or, um, but how often does that person get up 
say, in the middle of a feast and gets up and serves other people and serves the ones, indeed, that should be serving him. And that's what Peter says. When he gets, when he gets to Peter, we don't know what order he was washing their feet. We, I don't think Peter was first from, from the passage. It doesn't seem like he is because... But he was the only one that said anything to the Lord, which wasn't uncommon for him. But I don't get on Peter a lot because I feel I relate to him in some ways. And um, uh, he was the only one that said anything. I think the others maybe perhaps were just so stunned and so shocked that the Lord of glory, that Jesus, their Messiah, would do this for them, that they didn't say anything. So perhaps they were the wisest in the situation. But we learned some things from Peter's exchange with Jesus. And he says, Lord, there's no way, there is no way, never, ever, ever is the idea that you're going to wash my feet. Lord, do you wash my feet? He thinks that Jesus is lowering, lowering himself too much. He thinks that it's a too menial of a task for Jesus to take on. And it's interesting, again, that none of them, including Peter, never thought of doing it for each other. <laughs> they never got up and volunteered and did it. But he says, Lord, there's no way you're going to do it. And Jesus says, hey, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part with me. So then Peter says, of course, he goes the other direction. And, and the other extreme and I love his, his enthusiasm about life and everything, and especially his affection for Jesus. And he says, Lord, well then, if I'm not going to have any part with you unless you wash me, my feet, then wash me all over, you know, just, you know, pour it on. And um, Jesus then, I think, uses this, this um, picture of the preview of what his crucifixion and his death and his burial will mean. Especially that Jesus shed his blood on the cross for sin. That Jesus humbled himself, as Paul puts it in Philippians. And what does he say? He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. That's what Jesus did, even the death of a cross, of the cross. Jesus' humiliation was personified in this act of foot washing, yes. But it was personified, his humiliation, in the greatest way and to the greatest degree, in the giving of himself on the cross. He came to this earth. He left the glory of heaven. He laid it aside, so to speak, just like he laid aside his garments here. And he stooped down and became a man. He subjected himself to all the terrible things, that suffering, um, humiliation, being spat upon, being mocked, being ridiculed, being made fun of, being beaten, and culminating in being arrested as a criminal and hanging on a criminal's cross when Jesus did nothing wrong. The ultimate injustice was done to our Savior, and He allowed it. He voluntarily he voluntarily gave up the glories of heaven. He voluntarily subjected himself to live in a body and to walk among us and to show us, indeed, what love is. Love is demonstrated in the greatest way in Jesus Christ. Jesus loves you and I more than anyone more than your spouse could ever love you. Can you imagine that? Do you even grasp that? All the stuff they put up with, right? And I think about my dear wife and how much that God loves me even more than that. And even so much more 
Do we comprehend that? Can we even grasp it? Does it make us want to bow or stoop before our Lord and worship Him and say, God, I want you to use my life to touch other people. We live in such a lonely, um, what would you say, angry time, I think. I think the most, one of the most radical things that could happen today as a Christian, we hear so much about the word radical, right? Often in negative ways, right? How about some radical Christianity which expresses love for each other in the way Jesus did here? He loved us to the uttermost. He showed his disciples just some ways here through the foot washing. He didn't tell them, do this all the time, like an ordinance. You know, we're going to participate in the Lord's Supper soon. With that, he said, this do, right? This do in remembrance of me. With the foot washing, he said, when we get to verse 12 through 17, he says, now he brings the disciples together and he says, so do you know what I have done for you? You know what I've done for you? We're going to come back to that last part there with Peter in just a second. What have I done for you? He says, and of course, they didn't have a, they didn't have a clue, but at least no one said anything that time. Peter said, yeah, I know what you've done. <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't speak up there. But he says, do you understand what I've done? I am your teacher. I'm your rabbi. I am your master. I'm your Lord. And yet I stooped down and I washed your dirty feet. I've given you this as an example, he says. I did this as an example that you would have that same kind of attitude. That same kind of attitude. And I think we really need to ask God to help us to have that attitude. Because I know I, I don't have it most of the time. I'll be honest. I mean, I'm like any other person, you, you know, we too often think about, you know, just life, living life, taking care of ourselves, whatever. But how often are we thinking about others? And the verse that uh, Mrs. Williams, she, I remember you from the school with our children, and she was so good there at the school as secretary all those years, read that beautiful passage about thinking about others ahead of ourselves. I don't know about you, but that's one of the hardest things for me to do. So we need to, let's ask God together that we think about others ahead of us. And that's what this world needs today. It needs some radical Christianity like Jesus, Jesus displayed here. It needs some serving each other instead of wanting to be served. This world needs the love that we can show others that only Jesus can put in our hearts. And so when we get to that last part with Peter, he is painting for us a picture of the spiritual cleanness or the, the spiritual uncleanness that we need to be cleansed of, that we are sinners in need of a Savior. We need to admit that. We are sinners that need saving in the worst way, and only Jesus can forgive us our sins. The cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which you and I can hide. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. And it says here that the Lord makes this reference about, Peter, you know, you're clean already. You don't need a complete spiritual cleansing. You've trusted me. But he says, not all of you, not all of you disciples here are clean. And who is he speaking of? Of course, Judas. Judas had never bowed before Jesus as Messiah. Judas had never admitted that he was a sinner in need of Jesus' forgiveness and cleansing. And so I think that's also 
pictured here that he offers that cleansing. And that's what we need first if we haven't received. Before we are going around always serving others and trying to, well, at least asking God to help us to be serving others more, okay? Maybe we start there. And thinking about putting others ahead of ourselves and loving others in this way. If you've never been saved from your sins, I know the pastor will be glad to invite you to receive him. You need that spiritual cleansing first. And when he gives you that new birth, the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're saved, and now you can walk with him, and you can display with the Holy Spirit's help the same attitude, that attitude or mind that was in Christ Jesus that he expressed on the cross. Let's thank him together. Lord, we come before you right now. and We want to say we love you. We want to say we need you. We want to say so much more, too. Thank you for the music earlier and just what a great opportunity to bless you together. I thank you for what you're doing among these people and the leadership that Pastor Ryan Mills is, is displaying here. And thank you for the people that are here and that desire to bring glory to you together. God, help us to serve one another indeed as you served us. We know that we could never love completely to the greatest degree as Jesus did, but we do want to follow his example. As believers, we want to love you and love others, even as you had given in the new commandment. Help us to love you and to love others. We, we thank you, Lord, in the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. Thank you, brother. Yeah, I think it's fitting this morning as we talk so much about all this taking place around a table. The table features very prominently, especially in the New Testament. It's, it's this place of intimacy. It's deeply personal uh, it, it brings people together. There's an emotion that's tied in with sharing a meal. And so as we come together now to share in the Lord's Supper, we find ourselves approaching the table yet again. Something that's been on my heart lately when it comes to the Lord's Supper is the past and the future aspect of it. Yes, as we come to the Lord's table he calls us very clearly to remembrance. Do this in remembrance of me. When you do this, remember who I am. When you do this, remember what I've done. But there's a little tiny bit at the end of there that Paul mentions that we can, we can just miss if we're not paying attention. Verse 26 1 Corinthians 11, he says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When we come together, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, yeah, we absolutely remember, but we absolutely look forward to his return. We absolutely look forward to to the banquet table that is awaiting every Christian believer for eternity. We look forward to that celebration, that celebration that as believers in Christ never, ever ends. We know that in those promises are the assurance and the hope that we cling so fiercely to as Christians, those promises that he has given us of a future in his presence. So as we come this morning, I want you to keep all of that in mind. And what I'm going to ask you to do, we have a video called Come to the Table. Couldn't be more fitting. 
If you would, this morning, I want to ask everybody when we start the video here in a moment, make your way to the middle aisle here and just work your way up. You can pick up the elements here. We have our, our prepackaged elements. And then just split back off and take a moment up here at the altar to get right with God, to ask for forgiveness in those areas of your life where your feet need to be washed, where you need that little bit of spiritual cleansing. You don't need a bath. You need your feet washed. Come up here. Give that to God. Give thanks to God for the work that he's doing in your life. Get yourself prepared and then go ahead and head back around the outsides to find your seat. And then we'll all come back together and we'll share the Lord's Supper together. Amen? All right, let's begin, Mike. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. But as I told you, you've seen me and yet you do not believe. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus instituted this sharing of the bread and wine as an everlasting commemoration of his death, his resurrection, and the new covenant that he established. And he commanded us to partake of it until his return. His death reconciled us back to the Father and perpetuates the gospel of his redeeming grace. The Lord's Supper is a worship celebration, a thanksgiving to God for Christ's gift to us our eternal salvation. And it is an acknowledgement of His living presence during our worship. We come to this time with thanksgiving and with joy, but we do not come to it lightly. Let this be a time of reflection for you and search your heart, cleanse it of any sin and any unforgiveness that stains you. Before we share in this, let's share one more moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, bless this time of commemoration. We thank you that the Holy Spirit is at work among this people. We thank you for the nearness of Jesus this morning. Father, there is simply no greater joy than being in your presence. Father, we appreciate the fact that you call us to you. So Lord, bless this time of commemoration. Bless it as a time of looking forward as well. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he also took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant established by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. <clears throat> 